He does so through employing a particularly striking poetic technique of accumulating sensory aspects of the little moments of the everyday. <coughs> so, the, for example, the experience of the fisherman routine um, in a poem entitled Fisherman in Winter, uh, part of it is here, uh, defines the man against the elements. Uh, such sudden storm and drifts, we could see nothing. The boat fluttering in a net of reefs and cracks. The island's blind whales blundered about us. We heard the surge and plunge and the canning all around. On the, one, on the one hand, it seems to be carried from the point of view of the people on the boat. On the other hand, the islands are referred to as blind whales. In the above fragment, the elements are cognized in the direct way of human interaction and become a defining element of the fishermen as part of their cognitively constituted self. In the same process, the northern landscape of Orkney is internalized in the hermeneutical, interpretative way through the sensory experience of the place. But there is what you could call a labyrinth of vignettes of individual experience. And this is most striking in this volume of poetry. It is achieved through the technique of accumulated flashes of momentary sensory insight into some concretized present. Um, it could be little figures or it could be grand figures like St. Magnus, but also um, many unnamed sailors, whalers, fishermen, housewives, school children and the like. All of them engage in their defining activities where the crucial part of the defining process and thus of storytelling uh, is very strongly constituted by the sensory perception. All of those uh, characters form a gallery of recurring Brown's portraits to be found in his short stories, to be found in his novels. Uh, in another poem, The Horse Fair, uh, a little boy named Willie writes a poem about a visit to a fair and incidentally it happens to be uh, the Dunby Fur or Dunby Show, we passed this location on our trip and, uh, um, uh, and Frederick was commenting on it. Um, so uh, in this poem, um, Willie is um, uh, one of the school children and the school children are told by their, by their uh, teacher, Miss Instone, with a telling name, uh, to write a composition based on their experience of the fair. And this is the opening of the poem. Uh, Twelve slate pencils squeaked and squealed on slate like mice in a barn. Willie rubbed honey, out of, uh, honey of sleep out of his eyes, he wrote. I went to the horse fair. I sat in the cart beside old Da in Dunby. We left Daffodil in the Smithfield yard. A policeman was holding on to a man that could hardly stand. Old Da gave me a penny and a farthing. Old Da went into the inn. I bought a bottle of stone ginger at an old wife's tent. I saw hundreds of people. I saw skate horn the tramp. And the poem continues. And there is a back frame as well. And the teacher comments that this is all wrong because it's wrong punctuation. <laughs> Uh, and as, as you can see, uh, the, the, the frame is uh, written in, it, uh, it's uh, published this way, in italics, and, uh, and the, the boy's story is very simple and full of his impressions, uh, including his perception of his body, of himself sitting in the cart, um, a perception of the, of the people around, of simple, really, impressions. Uh, it, it could really... Uh, it, imitates the, 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 the point of view of a child, the, um, uh, the point of view a child might take. However, in um, uh, uh, brown stories, the local characters also merge with the world figures, like um, uh, the Troy, the, the Carthage, and Warsaw women, represented as one archetypal woman facing adversary condition, uh, conditions in the poem entitled Henry Moore, woman seated uh, in the underground. Um, how many thousands of years she has traveled to come to this place? Above burning wind, broken stone and water, she has sat in Troy and Carthage and Warsaw. She has endured sun and ice, uh, ice and sun. She sits 
pure from those weatherings. This is an abstracted and generalized woman, but at the same time a woman representing women in archetypal landscape of adverse weather conditions, which metaphorically represent some, some other aspects of experience, which is underdefined. Uh, you can see that um, although Brown is mostly in these poems, he's focused on northern imagery, it stops being just northern, Troy and Carthage and Warsaw. And this is combined experience of ice and sun. So he universalizes, he goes out of north. Um, uh, it's just a metaphorical representation of some, uh, of some historic moments uh, represented as hardship of uh, weather experience. Examining the focus on perception of those poems, one can see that what unites them is the particular poetically curtailed and understated insight into northern experience of life struggle, the experience grasped through the senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell and touch. The poems are mostly focused on telling some stories, but at the same time they are very narrative in quality, they are so to say epic in character, uh, although this happens on some curtailed or smaller scale. There is this tendency for brevity, the saga-like uh, technique uh, employed by uh, Brown. So these are the fragmentary plots and dramatic scenes made of a common mixture, the everyday routine events of Orkney inhabitants bent on uh, ensuring the well-being of the family and of the community, and they mingle with important historic or quasi-historic one-time events. Thus, some poems describe the expeditions coming to Scotland and to Orkney uh, from the Roman Mediterranean world, as the story, as the poem of Roman exploration of Orkney, poetically rendered through the poem entitled "Ships of Julius Agricola Sail into the Pantheon First. This poem reverts to the image of uh, bodily toil and bodily impressions involved in exploring the new lands in the north. And uh, I wonder if I should read all these examples. Um, another example is the story of Earl, uh, Earl Rothenwald's venture to the Holy Land in pilgrimage. Yet another, um, some other stories are oriented on reinforcing Orkney's sense of communal identity and typically for Brown, this is united with the community spiritual routine, as in the poems uh, recounting the details of uh, St. Magnus's martyrdom. It's a very happy coincidence that my speech happens on St. Magnus Day. Mm -hmm. I just feel very privileged. <laughs> um, and this is a fragment um, uh, from St. Magnus Day in the islands, and this is the very day today. The men of iron enters, dark from forge and anvil, smelling of soot and burnt water, strong from the tolling of his black bell and his boy with him, bearing horseshoes. Uh, the master of choristers turns a page, voices flutter like flames dropped flung, and resume, who is the Lord of hosts. End of quote. These poems have the features of pageant drama. They deploy songs and individual as well as choral voices mingled into statements of community unity through poetic dramatic enactment of historic or quasi-historic events. As it is in this song, I, I just didn't quote all of it, but there are voices coming of various participants uh, in the event. And all they constitute some poetic versions of the standard salient fragments of um, St. Magnus's story, uh, as known from saga source. Brown takes up the dramatic, pageant-like storytelling done through the voices, and, uh, and, and yet he manages to incorporate uh, individual perspectives. Uh, so Magnus's perception of what is happening, quote, so cold is it is in the kirk, so dark this April night, in cell and choir, his hands dovetail, like the once stone that locks an arch, end of quote. 
What is foregrounded in this passage and further is also the perception of Saint Magnus before and during his martyrdom. That you, in, you could notice in this poem some sort of processional character in the presentation of the standard version of events, the recognizable version of events. The mingled voices are those of sailors, St. Magnus, the priest at the Mass, uttering Christ's words of the First Eucharist. Uh, the soldiers, the blind seeking St. Magnus's help and coming to the tomb to be healed. So, the sensory experience in Brown's poetry is focalized from perspectives of different people, including different age groups. So there would be aging mother in one of the poems entitled uh, uh, soul scars. Um, this aging mother perceives her surroundings after she fails to recognize her son um, um, as he comes to give her money and to, uh, to say farewell to her as he is going to go away from Orkney. Quote, the fire sank, my mouth is dry, that creature of mine isn't back from the well yet. There are school children who do not perceive the immediate surroundings of their home, who, sorry, who perceive the immediate surroundings of their homes, and, uh, uh, and who are perceived by people outside at the community center. So uh, this poem, Island School, uh, is a meditation on the moment when uh, a boy has to leave his domestic sphere and go out to the threatening center of Orkney to school. Yes, um, to, um, so, uh, and this, this is just, I, I, I quoted the, here, um, I present here the passage referring to his experience, uh, which um, uh, focuses on his perception um, uh, and changing fragments of, uh, of um, uh, immediate surroundings that he, per he can perceive, but the poem continues to, uh, show yet another point of view. There is a little girl coming late to school and uh, it's perception of her, the way she smells, the way she looks, the way she moves. Um, and uh, and she's, uh, she's kind of downgraded as she's uh, a latecomer. And yet there is also grasping of the corn light in her eyes. Uh, so there is reminiscence of her sensory perception of her way to school. Uh, and her smell is perceived as composed of farm smells, quote, of peat and cows and the rich midden, <laughs> end of quote. In Brown's poetic insights, the sensory perception of the world can become central and very surprising device for achieving the lyrical, the metaphorical, the archetypal patterns of archetypal representation of the northern way of life. There is, uh, this is so in the poem the jars, uh, which is on the one hand the northern way of life, on the other hand it's meditation on, on humor, human experience of life as such. It relates the lyrical ego's experience of staying in an abandoned house and tasting the contents of the jar that he finds um, uh, there. And uh, it's divided into seven sections, very typical for Brown to have uh, poems, stories composed of seven parts. And his initial tasting of the jar contents reveals the taste of honey. And, um, uh, and his reaction is very positive, but on the next day he can taste salt. In this poem, Brown, and, and so it continues. And so it continues. And, um, uh, and then it turns into the taste of flailed corn emitting earth smell. Um, and in this poem, Brown gets close to the poetic application of the genre of magic realism uh, in poetic terms, because it has very eerie plot. Ghost-like presences uh, inhabit this house, and there are fantastic changes of the looks of house, of the perception of house, also of the looks and contents of the jar, which aren't otherwise motivated. The lyrical ego is uh, very appropriately for the convention of magic realism, uh, reticent in explaining and motivating all these changes. And, uh, and the 
uh, the way of framing it uh, in visual um, uh, and um, um, in terms of signs taken uh, brings it close to allegorical or mythical picture of human and individual uh, existence. Uh, there is uh, what is named as the mist shrouded moor, which is mentioned as the surroundings of the house, and it, uh, the house is said to have some sort of ghostly quality. Um, yes, and uh, I wonder how, how much into detail I should go when the time is already finishing. So perhaps I should, um, and, and the character in course of exploring the house perceives that he's aging and the final jar is like his ashes brought out of the house. So uh, it's very, very much focused on passing of time and passing of human life. So there are many interesting poems really that I would like to comment on and the, the striking thing about them is that Although sensory perception is something which I found unites them, they are very varied. The opening ti title poem of the collection, The Wreck of the Archangel, um, uh, gives a story of the wreck of the ship called Archangel, uh, taken from the perspective of local people who fail to notice, and they engage in their daily routines. And the description of that is introduced by the introductory question, who saw? And the answer in first stanza to this is none, just expressed in a sentence equivalent, just single word, none. And what follows is just focus on the daily routines of the peasants, which are framed in uh, standard sentences, with standard word order, so to say. But stanza three and four, which bring pictures of, 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 of what happened to the ship, its uh, syntax completely distorted and you can kind of see what happens, the fragmentation of the sentences which reflects the, what happened to the ship, yes? And the, the, this central question, who saw, who heard, is continued until there is one of the people exploring, they are, uh, they are just trying to retrieve what they can. Um, uh, the picture continues to show that they benefit, in fact, from the wreckage, that they are um, trying to find things which are going to be useful, or there, there are also bodies on the beach. And then the central question retell, returns because one of them hears a voice, a tiny cry, and they manage to find a tiny baby as the only survival. And this voice, this perception is constantly kind of hidden in this poem, but also the central opening question as well as what happens at the end brings it to the foreground, like perception. There is need for perception of what happened to the ship. Yes? Um, and yet some life hardships are also focused on as the man who actually finds the baby is an old man and uh, there is focus in the last stanza on his managing to make it up to being 70. Yes? and the way the hardships of life shaped him. So I, 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 I really have many conclusions in the way of, uh, of some observations, but I take them as a starting point for my further exploration of Brown's storytelling method. And what I just noticed at this time, when I already tried to analyze some of his short stories, some of his technique in the novels, as well as uh, some of his journalism, really, which I was looking up when I was here, it, what I notice is that Brown is kind of master storyteller in the way of combining the impossible techniques, like being very curtailed and, um, uh, and restrained and careful with words and at the same time managing to produce plenitude of impression and yet still keeping them down to the minimum and producing a uniform vision although there is always a plethora of voices employed and plethora of points of view. So this is it, thank you.